I'm ready. Okay. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the last session in the in the DSMBI summer school. So, uh, this is the session on reconfigurable computing, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jonathan Backer from uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, he'll be talking about Chipper, uh, its new his new DSL. And uh, Jonathan is also very famous in, in this colorful community for developing a DSL. Uh, named Chisel, so it became uh, vastly popular in the last few years. So, enjoy the presentation. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm looking forward to this. It's going to be a wild, wild show. Um, definitely going to be completely different than what you've seen before, but I'm going to try to uh, bring it back into uh, what you guys uh, think about a little bit, and uh, it's definitely work that we will. I'd be interested in collaborating with whoever on trying to make, make, it, make it work better in applications. But um, let me start by saying I'm going to try to do my uh, boot camp with uh, VirtualBox. Hopefully you've all installed VirtualBox. Um, I, have, I do have, um, so I'm going to pass this around. Um, people are going to grab one that I have about 28, 30 USB sticks, copy the chipper or the DSL summer school image. It's about four gigabytes. Um, and uh, you should just get started now. It'll take a few minutes. Um, and if you by chance didn't download VirtualBox, I do have a late, uh, the newest VirtualBox installer for the Mac. Uh, otherwise, you have to install it from the website. Just go to virtualbox.org. Okay, so so then once once you all have finished, um, we're gonna have to coordinate somehow because I only have like half the USB stick. So once people are finished, then maybe uh, raise your hand and we can collect them and give them to people that don't have them. And then I'm gonna want to collect them back at the end. Oh yeah, so. I am doing a very ambitious thing today. I'm going to cover a lot of ground. Um, and uh, we'll have more time uh, after this if people want to dig in a little bit deeper in, in, the, uh, in the studio session um, uh, before dinner. Um, so I'm, you know, I had, I had the title Reconfigurable Computing, so I'm going to cover what that means. Um, and. Uh, and uh, but also like try to discuss what hardware design is more generally. Um, I'm gonna uh, introduce you to this new programming language that uh, my student has been uh, developing called Stanza. Um, it's it's meant to be um, a a really good uh, language for hosting domain specific languages. So it's uh, and then. Um, I'm going to give you basic working knowledge of Chipper, teach you how to think in Chipper, and then I'm going to bring it back to reconfigurable computing. And what you really want to think about is writing accelerators to speed up certain applications. And so I want to teach you kind of what the, the overall interface is and how to think about writing an accelerator. Um, and I think by then you'll sort of know with the background of reconfigurable computing, and this kind of wrapper and, and toy example, you'll sort of have an idea of how you might, might get it going. But I can only cover so much in this amount of time. I'm going to give you uh, some pointers for getting uh, more information. And then lastly, although I don't have it here, I have had a great time here. I've learned a lot. And I'm going to try to reflect on what we're doing, how it compares to what you guys have presented, and I'm also going to try to present a few open problems in uh, domain-specific language uh, uh, implementation and design. OK, so what's hardware design? So at its most basic, we're, I'm talking about digital logic. And you really have two. It's, it's a really beautiful thing. <laughs> it's super simple, but uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to uh, scale it up to big design. The simplest description is you have logic and state. Um, you're basically writing state machines. Um, and so you, 
the one thing that you do in, in most people, there are other, and the thing that I'm focusing on is, is synchronous design. And that means that state is, is clocked um, with this one global clock or at least within a, a clock domain, you have this clock that's, that's latching the new state. So what you can think of is that the logic is providing the next state, and then the, time, the clock is arranged such that it has enough time to propagate and give a next state, so that then in a transaction, you can think of this as a transaction, it happens that all the state is committed. But otherwise, the logic here is working on the previous state. So previous state gives the next state, and it works like a really nice little machine. Um, and so here's like a simple little circuit that's uh, a counter, like call it the counter example. And it, um, it basically has, at reset, it starts at zero. This signal comes in at reset, one time signal. Starts at zero, this is a mux, so it selects between one or the other. It's like an if statement. Um, in hardware, and then it increments, and then from then on, that starts at zero, zero feeds back, you increment it, and you keep propagating, and the circuit just counts up. Okay, and, and again, this is, you know, you're computing, you're updating, computing, updating. This is, this is what hardware designers think about. So, we, I'm in the computer architecture group at Berkeley. We work on new machines, okay? You guys have talked a lot about getting applications to run fast. We're thinking about how do we get machines to run applications fast? So we design new machines, okay? And it's a little bit blurry here and there, and I think that's pretty provocative, but we are not looking, we'd love to go all the way from apps all the way down to hardware, but there is a huge amount of activity just trying to figure out what are the new GPUs? You know, what, what are the new parallel fabrics? Um, and that is a, a huge enterprise, and that is uh, something that we want to uh, make better using DSLs, but it's, it's, it's somewhat different. I just want to make that distinction, okay? There's ap applications trying to figure out using domain-specific languages to get them to run faster on existing hardware, and then there's how do we design new hardware, okay? The opportunity is huge. Um, I don't know if this was uh, brought home completely, but this is what I live and die. Um, this is what I'm funded to do, and it is that we currently, like the, uh, the the data centers are using a huge proportion uh, of, the, of the global um, energy uh, supply. And, uh, and like, for example, this was quoted, yearly power use of a phone is like a, frid a refrigerator. Um, and, and so we're just starting to bring the world online. Can we even afford all of our Google queries? How do we do those more efficiently? I think it would be pretty embarrassing and revealing, I'm sure they've, someone's calculated this, what it costs in energy for every Google query. But um, any event, there's a lot of room for improvement, but it really takes a lot of thought um, and careful design to get computing systems that compute um, more efficiently in, in power. Um, and then I'll just say that as an aside, um, we can't, because we have so many transistors and they're starting to leak, um, we, we can't even, we can't even run them, we can only run them as fast as, as we can, until they melt, right? So if we could run them faster if they're more energy efficient, right? Do you understand that? So like if we could run them faster, but, but the problem is the, the chips will melt. So the only way to go faster is to make them energy efficient. And the only way to save power is to make more energy efficient. So it's all about making it more energy efficient, right? Um, and so that's what we're trying to do. Um, and so I'm catering to this crowd. Um, there's uh, you know, huge teams of people that work on these chips. They have very little programming language experience. Um, and they're 
very careful about efficiency. They don't want to lose anything, right? So if you talk about a new way of designing chips, how efficient is it? How does it compare to the current very low level way of doing things? They're, they're really conservative. Um, but they're scared and they're incentivized because harder design sucks. It's like you use these really old style languages um, and they, they don't have good abstraction anywhere. Um, things are incredibly slow and expensive to, to sort of predict success. And then actually making a chip costs a huge amount of money. Um, and, and also, like, the difference between simulation and actual production or actual uh, chip uh, running is, is like 200 million times slower. So it's a real, you have, it's, 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 it's just, it's hell, basically. And it costs, it's super labor intensive. You can't afford to make a bug in the, in the actual chip. Um, so they spend vast amounts of money verifying things. And, you know, so the design costs are super expensive. They dominate. And the chip costs, the actual fab costs are super expensive as well. So the whole thing is just, like really painful, expensive, and uh, and yeah. So you say this is a big pain, but there are things like um, blue spec and lava in this space, which are designed by people in our community, and which they claim work pretty well. So yeah. Is that just that nobody uses them, and the ones they use are a pain, or um, are just... my friends lying to me? Or <laughs> uh, well, first of all, you go back to this efficiency. And is it something I can understand, right? And so you have to bridge the gap. You have to like, get people to actually understand the offering. And Lava is pretty difficult to understand. And BlueSpec doesn't offer a transparent efficiency model. Uh, so if you're really concerned about the last little bit of performance, then that could be a problem. Um, so I can't go into all the details, but I can talk to you. Part of your claim is that what you're doing is easier to understand than lava for engineers. Yes. And it, it incur, it's zero cost abstractions. So hopefully I'll convince you by the end. Wait, do lava's abstractions cost? I don't think they might, but it's very difficult for people to understand because it's in uh, a more challenging language to understand. Um, it's not a fun battle to fight, I'll just say. But, I, and I, I gotta say right up front, those are awesome. You know, I think they're great and they have made uh, good progress and there, are, there is adoption. I don't know that Lava's used much anymore, but Blue Spec is definitely something that's gotten some adoption. But it definitely it has these efficiency problems here and there. But you know, it's really nice. So you're going to be easy to understand and have a transparent efficiency level. Right. Okay. Okay. So I just want to put it into uh, your terms. Uh, you know, imagine if you were thrown back in those days where you had to program an assembly language. Compilation took hours. Um, you didn't get much feedback from the compiler, and you know, bugs took hours or weeks. And then burning CDs or whatever the distribution software costs millions of dollars. So there just wouldn't be many software startups, and no one would <laughs> enroll in computer science departments. Uh, <laughs> so we really want to get to a place where we can build chips in an hour a day. Um, we have affordable tools. Um, we have a whole set of libraries to choose from. We have a lot of abstraction, so forth. So. So I should say that was the promise of FPGAs, but they, I'm going to go through why that's not quite happening. It's kind of, it, it's, it's not quite there, and maybe, maybe you all will uh, help solve that problem. Um, OK, so now I'm going to do my bit on saying what reconfigurable computing is. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not actually a complete expert on it, but uh, I've, learned, I've learned enough to give you a, a, a kind of a broad brush stroke overview. Um, so, so I, guess, I guess the thing is that you first have to understand what the proposition is for doing hardware at all. Let's just say ASIC, ASIC is building a chip. That's application specific integrated circuit, okay? So that's what we do. Um, and I just want to start there. 
Okay, so why would you spend millions of dollars and you know throw throw all these people at a problem? Because you get fantastic speed ups, um, you save a lot of power, um, and yes, it's more expensive and it takes a lot, lot longer to program. I'm just throwing up these crazy numbers, but order of magnitude. Um, I think the most important one here is really like speed up. So people often quote like 100, 1,000 x speed up if you go to an application specific integrated circuit. Um, and so, okay, so that's, that's kind of the backdrop. That's the proposition why you do hardware. And then, you know, what is reconfigurable computing? Well, I, I set the stage for that because it's so hard to actually build chips. Um, what if you could program them more frequently, fix bugs, and so forth. Um, and, and maybe, uh, yeah, so, so you, get, um, you get the higher speed, lower power, um, but you, get, you incur less cost um, in doing so. That's, that's sort of the proposition. Um, and I just want to show, these are like FPGAs are often thought of reconfigurable computing. But there's been a long history of people inventing these, and there's been an evolution. I'm going to try to recount a little bit of that. But you know, it still continues on. There's, there's a new thing from Micron on cellular automata that are near memory. There's um, a bunch of research on coarse grain reconfigurable arrays. It does bring up the curious question of what is harder. <laughs> you know? So is this hardware still? You know? um, so. I think I can probably convince you that an FPGA is hardware, um, but is, is, is this array of processors hardware anymore? But let me just start with FPGAs. Um, so we already have the background in hardware now. You know your logic and your state. And so the basic components of an FPGA are pre pretty much just be able to configure all those components. And so you have, instead of fixed functions, you have these programmable logic elements, and they're like lookup tables. That's what LUT means. And so you have all functions from two Boolean inputs to one output. So you can actually, the programming of it is to say what that function is. And they go all the way up to larger number of inputs. Um, and so you have you know, often like six input LUTs. Um, and there's a whole bunch of you know, ideas on how to configure, make them, present them to people. But then there's other things. So from state, there's, um, there's uh, these uh, flip-flops that are the state elements to actually do the synchronous kind of um, registering of state. And then the other things that you don't, well, the other part is the wiring because we aren't burning that into a chip. We have to configure that as well. So there's some sort of network where we can, you know, by, at program time, circuit switch it so it's configured to route information exactly how we want. Um, and then there's I.O. So here's kind of like an overview of that where um, you, can, you can just kind of like put down these uh, connections here and you get, like this is kind of a, uh, it routes any of these to any of those by just putting down um, a program bit. And then you got your logic bot, the LUTs that you can program. And then the last piece is the I.O. blocks, which on an FPGA you can, um, you can control like whether they're input, output, what voltage they run, and that kind of stuff. So that's kind of the, like, the simplest FPGA. Um, but then it evolved. So it's always beautiful when you can build something out of the like, smallest number of components, but there's a cost to that. Um, and so what they started doing was building bigger hard blocks that are configured at a higher level. Um, so there's less overhead for the reconfiguration. And those are like DSP blocks that just do kind of like 48-bit uh, 40 or whatever the chunk size is of add or multiply. Um, instead of building that all out of logic with these lookup tables, that would be, take a lot of area. So they f DSPs became a nice thing to put on an FPGA. Then to build um, memory out of flip-flops would be really expensive. So they started putting block RAMs in. Um, and those are all done very densely. So they take up less area than you would do if you wanted to build a RAM out of flip-flops. 
And then there's um, a whole bunch of hard blocks that started getting thrown in. So if you want to do memory controllers, again, this is like just completely plastic hardware. I could, in theory, write a memory controller. Doing it in practice is really hard. And so people would start to put hard blocks in to do the memory controller because it was just, it was really, it was really difficult to do uh, in an FBGA. Um, and there's a whole slew of those. Um, and then um, there's, uh, then they started coming up with the idea, well, we could put a CPU in uh, by just doing F on an FPGA, just building it using the programmable fabric. Uh, but why don't we just put a hard CPU in there? And so that, that's uh, the next thing. And then now, you know, well, FPGAs aren't good at flowing point. Let's put flowing point block. Anyways, that's the evolution of what's happened with FPGAs. Um, so, and then the programming part is you design the circuit in Verilog or some kind of low level language. I'll go through a little example of that, but it basically specifies the wiring pretty, pretty, in a pretty literal way, mostly, um, and selection of the uh, components and state. Um, and then you have to configure your, your chip um, with the I.O. and clock rates and all that sort of thing, and there's a little GUI for that. And then you run this place and route uh, software that figures out where to put your circuit components on the fabric and, uh, and you know, tries to map as best as it can to available hard blocks like DSPs and so forth. And then finally, um, it tries to route all the signals. Okay? And if the routing doesn't work at that point, it starts all over. <laughs> and randomly tries to find another placement. So anyway, this, is, this takes a long time to run. Um, all right, so what are FPGAs good for? Um, if you have a lot of parallelism, um, and um, let's see, and you, and you also have things that, like bit manipulation type, low bit width things, then um, you're going to do really well. Now, I should say a caveat on the memory access. Uh, actually, that doesn't work so well unless you have a good connection to memory. So currently, that's not, it's not good if you need high bandwidth type uh, al algorithms done on FPGA. But that will change. Anyways, the other really thing that people use it for is hard real time. We can't really do hard real time so well on CPUs and operating systems and so forth. It's really good for FPG, FPGAs are really good at it. Um, and then there is this promise that they're lower power and they are a little bit lower power, um, but they haven't been designed and optimized to be as low power as they probably could be. Um, and then the other thing is, if you just want this little embedded thing that's gonna fit in on a robot or somewhere in the world, then this is a nice uh, way to go. Okay, um, but they're bad because they're extremely slow to program. They're painful to debug. All, all the usual problems with hardware. Uh, they're hard to interoperate with. So if you have an algorithm, you have some software connecting to the FPGA and talking to it, it's, that's hard to arrange and people do that over and over and over again and it really takes a, a lot of time to do and it involves like, you know, Linux drivers and crazy hardware blocks and all kind of reading these really thick manuals and, you know, any event. If you, traditionally, if you want to do double floating point, that doesn't work so well. Um, bandwidth intensive compute. Um, and uh, finally, I should say, that in addition to the programs being slow, they sometimes fail. <laughs> they're quirky. They're weird. They're, I don't know. I can't explain it. But it, uh, they kind of got a monopoly <laughs> on us. So what can you do? Um, that part you can't really do unless it, there's people that are trying to figure out. There's, anyway, I'll just say that there's, there's not a good solution right now for addressing that. OK, so now let me get back to the plot that I said. So like where FVGAs fit in. So the, the trade-off is that I want to make it faster to program or to reconfigure. So I'm willing to give up some speed um, and some power um, to make it faster and easier to program. Um, 
And so, and also, instead of actually fabbing a chip, I just buy these chips, okay? And so there's like a nice plot, is like what is your volume uh, if you're going into making hardware? Like what's your volume? And then you can know exactly when it makes sense to make a chip. Because chip, chips are gonna cost less after a certain amortization point. You know, where you sell a certain volume, then the actual chips themselves cost very little. Um, so FPGA companies are very much in touch with this and they try to make the price as high as they possibly can um, to just match that like little trade-off point. Um, and unfortunately for us, our hobbyists and academics, well academics get free FPGAs, but hobbyists, we don't have really low cost FPGAs so much um, because they're trying to milk all the paying customers. All right, so now, this is maybe the most important thing to, to you and where active development is happening. And that is like, so if you're really trying to build an FPGA system, how do you control the FPGA? And how do you talk to the FPGA um, more generally? So I'm just gonna go through some different system architectures. Um, one is you just buy this USB stick um, and uh, you, you really, one option is you just don't, you put the entire thing on the FPGA, maybe you have minimal I.O. It's just talking to the world, but there's no connection to software as such. It's really like the software is, the controller is a state machine, okay? Um, so that's not, that's not actually the easiest way to do it, but that's been a lot of what people have done. And then uh, people have started to popularize putting these FPGAs in uh, your uh, box so you can basically talk to them through PCI Express. And I really like this company, Piho Computing, that got uh, bought by uh, Micron. And they, they provide Linux drivers so that you can actually um, do uh, streaming to the FPGA. Um, and they provide the, the hardware design pieces, modules, to be on the other side to receive the messages or just do the communication, the buffering, and so forth. Um, and so the communication is through the PCI Express. Okay, that means it's in a different address space and you have to copy data back and forth, very much like a GPU. Okay. Okay. Um, so another option that's kind of always an option is that, like I said, I handed to this earlier, is if you actually have a design for a processor, you could just put it in the fabric, and then you can talk to the other, the, the hardware that you, the acceleration hardware that you wrote um, any way you want. Um, of course, that's easier said than done, but this, I'm just saying this kind of subsumes everything, um, and you can kind of get more, better control the uh, speed and latency, bandwidth and latency that you talk uh, between your accelerator and the processor. But it, it, it hits, a, it, you know, it can only go so fast. Anyway, and then um, there's been this new idea of like hardened CPUs um, that are put on the same chip, okay, um, and, and then there's, uh, or, or on the same board uh, done. Okay, so let's just start with Zinc. Zinc is, a new offering by Xilinx and Altera has one like this. It has a couple ARM cores uh, talking to your FPGA fabric and then they use the usual ARM interconnect and that's AXI. Um, and, uh, and then they have this other thing called um, ACP which you can talk to your, uh, between uh, your ARM and your, uh, uh, um, your fabric. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. And then finally, the latest thing that's coming out of Intel is a connection uh, between um, your FPGA and your, and your, and your uh, processor through uh, this um, uh, QPI, which is like a interconnect um, that they use for memory and CPUs and so forth. So I'm going to go through that a little bit. But first, the thing to keep in mind is this. As a programmer, uh, you have these things you're trying to optimize for, and then there's stuff that makes your life easier. <laughs> um, and so let me just start with, everyone knows what throughput and latency are, and there's various uh, results for that uh, based on 
the different configurations. Um, and then, then there's this notion of whether um, you, you can share memory in a coherent fashion between the processor and the fabric, okay? Um, and there are, uh, the last three offer that. Um, that's, that's pretty important, unless you just want to copy stuff back and forth. And then finally, um, <laughs> this is pretty important, and I think uh, GPUs were sort of used to not having the GPU be in the same address space as the CPU, but it w it's really convenient when they're in the same virtual address space. Um, and so that you can send addresses to the FPGA and it will be able to use those to ask for memory, right? And they're all the same virtual addresses. Um, and and that, that's, that's this new thing that QPI Harp offers that makes it really convenient and nice. Um, uh, so this is the Zinc uh, development board, which is actually pretty, pretty nice. And the only thing it doesn't offer is that last thing where you have physical addresses. Um, so you kind of have to manage you know, to that, that mapping yourself. Um, but it does have like good interface with the ARM and then DMA. Um, um, right, okay. And then uh, let me just say uh, how you might use the harp thing. Okay, so I, uh, this, this thing, you can set it up for DMA and do the streaming across things and you get, it's coherent with the memory so you get that, that remove those problems but you have the physical problem. The harp system is something I think you guys might be getting one of these um, and it, it is real, it's really pretty cool. So it is, it is really trying to bring to FPGAs what has been the usual uh, model for um, sharing between sockets memory. Okay, and so um, this was talked about NUMA uh, yesterday. Um, and the way that you, it works is you configure the FPGA with uh, you know, these control registers um, through this interface. Um, that are, these are all memory mapped registers. Um, and then you, you basically uh, configure, um, you configure the, uh, the shared region and you pin it in a such a way that it'll work well. Um, and then um, on, on the, uh, on the uh, FPGA, you get a cache with cache line, um, and it is, it is managed for you in such a way that it's cache coherent with the system. You can also get a complete cache line in one go, which is like 64 bytes, which is, you know, you're, it's, you know, a lot of information in parallel. Um, and so streaming is really high high bandwidth, um, and, and the system is very low latency too. It's been designed to be super low latency for, um, for, for their system. Um, and then so like the big thing that's really hard to do that you can start to do is do like graph algorithms on, a, on, a, on an FPGA where you can just like be walking all over memory or garbage collector or whatever. So because this thing is, uh, has a TLB, which is basically the mapping from virtual to physical addresses. It does all that in hardware for you. You don't have to manage that. It's a very friendly way to set this up. And then finally, if you want to do queues like you do uh, with OpenMP and so forth, it supports all the uh, basic locks through memory. OK. So why is it? Um, why is it so hard to program, uh, why is it so slow and so forth? And what are the opportunities? Um, well, I already told you that the algorithms just aren't, <laughs> I don't know, aren't very impressive for doing the place and route. Um, and so they, you know, as you start to use more and more of the FPGA, things go to, uh, start to go to a crawl and you're talking about hours to wait. But so hopefully we can get to a point where we can actually program most of it and then partially reprogram parts of it. Um, and then this, what I'm showing you here is um, that it would be really nice if we could basically do the effort hierarchically and then reuse that place and route. So we can basically just have pre-computed place and route blocks 
and then compose them at the next level up. And that, that's called floor planning with ASICs, and it would be really great if that worked really well. Because then you could amortize the cost of actually running the tools on your little blocks and then start to compose bigger systems out of those blocks with, with a, using a lot less time. Um, but there is, unfortunately, and this might be interesting to you, there's a whole community of people that build overlays. I talked about soft processors, but people actually build complete parallel computer architectures that are tailored to like OpenCL and so forth because they don't want to wait around for this reprogramming. So they basically just, you know, uh, program once the FPGA and then from then on they use their tools to program it because they're programming to the overlay which is like a parallel computer. Okay, so, th so I talked about the soft processor. That's, just, that's a simple version of it. You can put a processor on there, you can talk to it, send load code on it, run it, and so forth. You could run a complete parallel machine on that, multi-core, um, program it once, and then load code on all the cores. So there's an active area of research, and that might be interesting to you guys, because um, it helps with the speed of programming. Um, I think that uh, this uh, QPI system uh, from Intel, OK, what's the future of reconfigurable computing? I think what Intel is doing with QPI is, is, is going to make it a lot easier for people. Um, I think there's more you could do. Um, cache isn't always the best way to communicate, and they do offer modes so that you can avoid some of the cache overheads to communicate by saying it like read only and write, write only and so forth um, uh, when you communicate to your cache. Um, I think that course reconfigurable arrays will be really interesting. No one's actually really come up with a good solution to that, but the difference between what academia comes up with and what actually works in industry is, you know, maybe is completely different um, for different reasons. They succeed or fail, um, but it's definitely a compelling thing. Um, but no one's really come up with a better solution than an FPGA for reconfigurable computing. Um, but the overlay thing could be promising, but like I, I was trying to say, like every time, uh, it's sort of like the last talk, which I wasn't here for, but it's like every level of interpretation adds like 10x or something, right? Um, and so if you do an overlay, then you're going to run at ten, one tenth the clock speed that you would if you built the chip out of it. Um, so, I mean, it would be really cool if you could just JIT hardware, <laughs> you know, on the fly. But the reconfigurability problem is so slow, you know, you, it would, you know, anyways, interesting research problem for, for any ambitious students out there. Um, and then open source FPGA. Maybe if we actually had all the tools, um, you know, John uh, Warsneck at Berkeley had proposed this. Um, again, ambitious project, but we need to sort of own the FPGAs and the tools so we can make progress as a community. Okay, any questions? That's, that's my uh, reconfigurable computing section, and uh, now you know everything about reconfigurable computing. But if you, if you don't actually um, didn't get any of that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, great. All right, so, I mean, mostly people don't even want to know about this stuff. They just like want it to work and work well and all that. But this is like one level below uh, d digging deeper so you have a little bit of insight. Okay, but let me give you a little insight into the status quo of writing hardware. Okay, and so this is the counter that we had. Um, and this is a little snippet of Verilog that I talked about. So it really is a pretty literal way to write circuits. You have ways to write um, the, uh, the, the, the flip-flops. It's called registers, um, the state elements. And then you, you can actually uh, write to the hardware. Um, you can actually even write a more directly where you write the MUX and choose depending on reset, whether it's zero or plus one, this last state. Um, but this is kind of what it looks like. And the problem is um, that all that we've been talking about all this week doesn't work very well, right? So you want to do metaprogramming. You want to like basically parameterize your designs so they're more flexible, right? Um, and so unfortunately, you end up writing this, this counter like over and over again because you can't write the, the last counter. 
because um, there's no way to parameterize it and have it be a generator. Um, there is limited support for it um, in a generated command, but it's like all the other problems with people trying to write these limited programming languages, they always hit a wall and it's really frustrating and you got to understand that weird you know, syntax and semantics and so forth. Um, one of the things that people do, the, the actual the state of the art in the industry is writing Perl scripts that write Verilog. And then um, as far as the qu quotation thing um, that we heard earlier about and people have talked about, um, there is an effort at Stanford um, that is called Genesis and you write Verilog where you quote the system Verilog and, and you can do the quasi quotation of system Verilog within Perl. And so that's, that's, that's basically what people are, like you, if you, Saying that out loud, I mean, you understand now what you're up against when you're trying to get adoption. You know? <laughs> so they want to bring in the power, but they don't want to scare people. They want to make people understand that we're not adding any overhead. It's not any kind of crazy magic going high-level synthesis. It really is just doing simple kind of metaprogramming that's all getting resolved at compile time. OK, so I've been lucky enough to work with this amazing team of students and faculty and, and staff. Um, and uh, I work with John Warsnek, Krista Asanovic uh, as faculty and a bunch of students. So uh, we've been at this for five <laughs> painful years uh, and it's starting to get good and fun. Um, what, and so I just want to tell you a little about Chisel, um, which is what um, we heard about, uh, alluded to. Uh, it's um, this thing we've been working on for five years. Uh, it's, it's basically trying to do metaprogramming for hardware construction in, in uh, Scala. Um, and so the basic way to read that is that uh, you can, um, you basically embed uh, all those basic uh, uh, digital logic uh, ideas in a programming language and then you, you basically write a program that generates uh, the hardware, right? Um, and, um, and you write it once and you get all these outputs of it. So you can do simulation. We try to go as fast as we can to kind of bridge that 200 million X uh, gap. Um, and, but we also put out Verilog for FPGAs and we tape out a lot of chips. Um, and so what we're trying to do is make hardware design more like software design, okay? Um, and we're borrowing, there are a lot of good ideas actually from hardware design, we're, we're using those. Um, and we're trying to grab as many ideas from software engineering as we can. But it's not high level synthesis. I guess this is pretty easy for you guys to understand because um, you guys are doing metaprogramming, stage uh, programming and compilation and all that. So it really is writing a program that generates uh, uh, hardware. Or actually in this case it writes, generates this graph that then gets translated down. Okay, um, I just want to like talk briefly about a couple big successes. About the same time that we uh, created, um, started Chisel, we also started RISC-V, and this is an open source instruction set architecture like x86 or ARM. You know, it, if you look at the instruction set and assembly language, all of that, plus how do you interface with an operating system, all the stuff that you have to worry about when you're writing an operating system or a compiler. We have written a standard that's open source that you can compile to um, you can make hardware that conforms to, you can use our Linux port, you can use our OpenCL, our LLVM, our GCC, our G++, all that stuff we give you. And all you have to do is conform to the standard. It's a very simple instruction set, powerful idea, no one's done it. Uh, well, I should say. Um, some people have done it, um, but it's really hard to do. We've been at it for five years. Uh, and we're kind of crazy enough to do it, um, and now it's starting to pay off. And I just say that um, one thing that we do, we actually have, you can look at risk5.org, and we have um, Rocket Chip, which is a generator in Chisel that generates a whole family of processors, uh, entire systems with cache, floating point, um, and, uh, you know, um, number of processors, this like a huge design space that you can just give in parameters and it spits out a working processor that boots Linux, all right? And, you know, all right. Um, LBNL, Lawrence Berkeley Labs, has been pretty inspired by Chisel 
and they, uh, they want to go level up, and they're, they're working on a way to configure whole systems, systems on chips, and a lot of times the components are connected through this network, and so they've been trying to write a generator that generates all this, allows you to parameterize it in ways like the Bill Daly knock book, if you're familiar with that uh, network on chip uh, book, describes like all the configurations, the topology, the, you know, the, the various things that you would do, um, and they can just write that as a generator and chisel. Um, so they're really excited about that. A lot of people have gotten excited about that. Um, so hopefully we can take it next level up. Um, but here, we, we had a huge amount of success writing all these generators. One of the big ones is uh, out of order processor, which is like the one on your phones. We can generate just a ton of different ones. And just this idea, this crazy idea of like writing generators, which you guys are really familiar with, but just applied to hardware design. Um, we've taped out, I don't know, way more than six chips. Taped out like 10 or more chips. Um, so we're getting like record speeds on our chips. Um, and that is because we have this zero cost abstractions. What the generator just removes all the abstraction for you, like you've heard earlier. We just do that for hardware design. Okay, so same picture, different name. Um, so uh, I thought it would be fun to show you guys something I've been working on with a student, uh, a couple students, uh, mainly Patrick Lee. Um, he's been working on this new stanza language. I'm going to tell you about that because hopefully you guys are all uh, programming language nerds out there. And, uh, and uh, thought it would be provocative to look at you know, what, it, what would be another language for embedding DSLs in. And then how, how does, uh, you can look at chisel code. I, I don't have any here, but you can see some of the designs. But uh, we think we have a really pretty slick embedding in, in Stanza. So fun to show it. Here's, here's pa uh, Patrick. Um, and so uh, I guess this, uh, you heard a little bit about Stanza in, in the, the, very, the very first uh, talk uh, introducing us. Um, so it has, uh, it's trying to do, um, be really easy to understand, um, but powerful to use and, and high performance. It has gradual types, has a, like a really nice type system. Very simple to understand, hopefully, for people they're getting into. Um, doing DSLs when you know the DSL users might not understand type systems so well. Um, uh, it has very orthog orthogonal concepts implemented, so uh, it uses um, you know it separates functions, objects, um, pipe, pipes, and the control uh, mechanism, and namespaces are all very well separated, and that I think adds allows you to compose uh, new languages uh, a lot easier. Um, uh, and, uh, and the whole thing is 20,000 lines. It has a native compiler. Um, and it's pretty cool. You guys can take a look at it. It's on your uh, USB stick. OK, so has everyone got the USB image copied? OK, all right. All right. Um, and then the other thing we've been playing with, uh, I know you guys have been playing with it here. Um, we've been playing with uh, how to uh, do a new macro system. So it's kind of an open, interesting research uh, challenge that people uh, thought a lot about. Um, we think we have a pretty nice solution um, within um, within uh, a, uh, a conventionally syntaxed language, um, and it just it allows you like basically the entire almost the entire stanza ri is written in it, um, and uh, it's really cool. So this is this is Patrick's work, um, and uh, it's pre it's really exciting and inspirational to me. Um, so um, let's see. So I'm, I'm going to keep going. Uh, let me just try to, like, uh, you guys will figure out what it, how it compares to other things. But let me just try to, like, uh, do stanza in five or 10 minutes. Um, and so uh, you can, um, it has integers and types and so forth. Um, and so, you know, the usual print, print line, it has, uh, similar to uh, Scala, it has way to name the infix operators and the macro system kind of does the expansion for you. Um, you can type uh, the variables. It has uh, a way um, to do type inference. These are like, uh, like in Scala. 
constant immutables. Um, and then it has characters and strings, so forth. Um, and yeah, get is like uh, this indexing operation. Um, and then it's got variables uh, done like that. Um, it has like somewhat of a Python syntax. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, you basically, here's like a while statement here. Um, and then the for, sta for statement uh, basically creates a range with uh, 0 to 10. And then this, this keyword is actually what, it's, this is a macro that expanded into do whatever this keyword says, and it's fed this body plus this collection, um, which is pretty powerful. Um, and then here are some of the collections that you can do. And I, I'm not just doing this advertised stanza. Uh, you kind of need to know some of this. And actually, uh, I will, on your, uh, once you get things booted up, uh, you can look at this and refer to this. Um, so that if you need for the homework assignments. Okay, so you can do the usual things like this, and here's how they play out. Um, you have ranges, arrays. Um, these are like stretchy arrays um, that you can add to. Um, and then you have, tuples are sort of the literal type that you get, um, and you can uh, destructure into those. Um, and then, of course, it has lists. Um, and it has a parametric type system. Um, so you can create arrays with a particular type, and this is the way you type it. Um, it also has the notion of captured types, where the types are inferred from uh, notated arguments. Um, and so that's how you would do it here. You don't really need to know about this stuff, because I'm not going to give you a problem that requires this, but it's kind of cool um, the way this works. And it's pretty intuitive, I think, to people. Um, and then uh, the difference is that when you use this, OK, this is like array indexing. You don't have to supply it directly. Here, you're supplying directly the type with the angle brackets. It's inferred. And it's inferred from the question mark position, that argument. right? It infers that t from that argument. Um, so you're in control of how, how the inference happens. And that, that actually works out quite well. Um, and, uh, and then um, uh, this should be indented. Um, there's a stream system. Uh, there's a lot of really coolness in this. Uh, I won't go into that. But basically, you have this notion of streamable, which is things that can be converted to streams. And then you have the stream iteration protocol, which you can say, are you at the end, and get the next one. Um, so this is supposed to be indented, like I said. So you're going through all the elements and printing them out of S. Um, and then, right. So then this is more of, uh, of, of iteration or for loops. Uh, so in addition to iterating over ranges, you can iterate over collections using uh, that are streamable. Anything that's streamable can be done this way. Um, and uh, you can do it in parallel. Instead of using zip, you can do it with the parentheses, which is pretty cool. Um, and you can also generate values with yield in a generate statement. So these are things that you might need. Um, you had the zero to false, the yeah. uh, Zero to false. Oh, yeah, that, that just means there's no bound to how high it will go. OK. It, it's, it's not that that because I'm being lazy. I don't want to do length of table. OK. Or maybe I can't even know because like, it's a stream thing. Um, so I just want to get a new index for all the elements. Um, and then the, uh, the functional programming is really lightweight. Um, so you have. Uh, really nice notation for anonymous functions. Uh, so you can do F, fn uh, directly, or you can do these abbreviations with the curly braces and an underscore. It's probably pretty familiar to everybody here. Um, and you can do reduction and all that. Anyways, um, and then there's like now we start getting into more the uh, object oriented programming, and it's done through multi methods. 
So you have uh, def multi is a way to uh, create a generic function. Um, and, uh, and then you can write methods on it that are overloaded um, with their parameter types. Here's an example of that. And then here's how you tie it all together to object-oriented. Um, you can uh, write, um, you can actually instantiate interfaces. You can write an interface, write a bunch of methods or multis on it. And then you can, here's going to do a blimp. Um, and so now I'm writing this constructor that takes as the argument the, uh, you, you just close over that argument. Now I can write the radius. And so here's the call that constructs it, the factory item. Here's code that can run. And then finally, you create the object, blimp, and you attach the methods inside here. That is a little unusual, um, but it's pretty cool. Um, it also has like, uh, you can uh, do or and and types. Um, and uh, you can do subtyping with interface. You can subtype. And then you can add multis and so forth. So you, but, but every time you have to re-implement all the things, that, that's just kind of a design uh, constraint that people were putting on you. OK, so that's, that's like basically whirlwind stanza. Um, it's, uh, you can read about it at uh, lbstanza.org. Uh, Patrick's written stanza by example. Um, you can look at the, the core library and the verse. They're in um, what I've given you um, in one of the directories. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a little slower than we'd like, but uh, there's really low hanging fruit. And so by the end of the summer, we're going to have a really zippy, amazing native compiler that uh, Patrick's been working really hard on. Um, and uh, so that'll be available. Um, you can download it today, like I said, but uh, it's a little bit more experimental. Um, it works really well. There are very few bugs I've ever hit in it. Um, and we're um, going to write a bunch of papers on the type system, macro system, and uh, coroutine foundation, which are pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, and I can say that because that's Patrick's, mostly Patrick's work. So uh, anyway, let me just uh, now just go through, uh, get into like what, uh, generators mean um, this is kind of the mental model that I've grown to like do for hardware designers because they they're, it's a little, a little wacky to them to think about actually using a programming language to construct circuits so I usually like go here's a snippet of code and this is the graph that it produces so it wouldn't be unlike you know what you've heard about before but in the this is what I do to teach um, circuit design um, so a mux a multiplexer it's like an if statement it's just choosing between one or the other uh, the condition is choosing between x and y, so it produces that graph on the right. Um, and now I can write a module which pretty much has exactly the same uh, stuff here, um, um, but wraps it up in, in this module um, and provides these ports, x, y, and z. Uh, and, uh, and now I can actually create a bunch of those modules and link those all together using connections, okay, um, and uh, build a bigger circuit. Um, I can also write, I could wrap that expression that I had originally in a function and, and call it with parameters, okay, seems pretty natural. So I can, I can just uh, construct any, any mux or max2 circuit with any arguments and just use like functional programming to do that. Um, and this is, uh, you know, where I want to max over, um, let's see, uh, and now I'm getting, well, you're going to see this later, but um, where uh, you want to, um, you have four inputs coming in. This is a vector type here. Um, and uh, I don't actually need the end here, sorry. Um, I could put the end here, actually, uh, which is even more powerful. Um, but the example has four uh, uh, W width U ints coming in, and now I'm going to construct as many max twos as I need to, to actually reduce um, the information, do the max over all the inputs. Okay, so that's functional programming constructing circuits. Okay. Yeah. So this W is a value, right? 
but then this this uh, yeah it works greater are the types right so you can put the value in the types yeah you can do that yeah so the macro does some magic and it, and it just works um, but we get we give this notation that's very much like what Verilog looks like which so like I said this is experimental I've never tried this on people but it's pretty cool because it's like so close to the way you write Verilog and so you like widths are really important part of of hardware so we make a particular kind of syntax for it um, and actually you can just grab them and, and it just expands and so like if you go through the expansion you can see exactly what it what it's doing um, but essentially it doesn't have to be a static number it can be um, yeah and so the other like I said this could be n here so you can have any number of elements done dynamically at meta programming time you know? so yeah. Uh, does it support uh, pipelining? And uh, if so, does it make sure that the data arrives at uh, the same time? Um, that's a program you got to write. Um, so you can write, um, yeah. So I would like the read time. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk a little bit about where we're going. Um, if you want to pipeline stuff, you can programmatically put in pipeline registers. Yeah, yeah, you can totally do that. If you want to retime it and have all the stages be balanced, that's harder. And if you want to like match things so that they arrive at the right time, that's a harder program to write. But it's software. You just write the software. I mean, that's what's cool about this. I'm writing a program to generate hardware. Um, you know, and uh, sometimes don't, things don't fit. You want to compose that part of retiming against this. I'm going to talk about that later. So we don't we don't advocate that users will retime their circuits. We want to delay that decision later. Um, so, so we want we have a, a, an idea about how to do that. Yeah. So your thing is that uh, n doesn't need to be static; you have to be used as a yeah. As a tag. So, um, is that some kind of dependent types? No. Nah. So how does it work? It just it just records that number, and then it is building this data structure which records the number that you give it. Okay, and then you've you've committed to that number. It's not like you can give, give that number be something that is changing at, at, at in, in the circuit. Okay? It's static. It is static, but it's a parameter. There's a distinction, it's right? It's basically like C++ templates that can have Yeah, input. yeah, yeah. Okay. So, you know, the trick is that we're doing everything at compile time. But you want to parameterize stuff in a really powerful way. Sure. What's the best way to do that? Write a program that takes arguments that are your parameters, you know? It's an arbitrary program. It generates circuits. That's kind of the idea. Um, and then the other trick, I guess, is just use the base notation, have all of the circuit uh, building blocks, the lowest level primitives. And then, um, then the idea is we have really powerful composition, which is what programming languages give you. And so you can just basically compose all the way up and add all kinds of abstraction levels. And those are all for free, because they get resolved completely. Yeah. Can you do arithmetic? So can you do say output is like W plus one? Uh, yeah, if it gets resolved at compile time. Oh. Um, and we have different types for compile time and and hardware. We we just call it. I guess it's like compile time, and hardware and software types. Hardware types, you know, it would be a type error. Right. If you tried to use a hardware type as a width. Okay. You'll see that in a second. Okay. So this, is, this looks like it could be a good uh, Scala DSL. It, it, what's the reason for making it in that language? Uh, well, um, it, I should have just shown you the comparison. We're just doing research in how to do new hosting languages. Um, we think this is actually, uh, we think that we've got a pretty clean way to specify hardware. Um, and currently, Chisel is a little bit more long-winded and you see a little bit more of the overhead. Actually, you know, you can look at the identical boot camp done in Chisel and do it like one-to-one -one and see all these examples <laughs> pretty much. And you can see, and we're just trying to do like how seamless could we do an embedding? So, you know, it's least scary, you know, to hardware designers. Um, and yeah, it's just research. Um, 
But, but I, I just wanted to point out that Chisel is, is alive and well and thriving, and uh, I spend a good chunk of time on that, uh, promoting that. And so we're very excited about Chisel and Scala and everything. I'm just showing you an alternative, because I think it's fun at a DSL you know, workshop. Come on, let's come up with new hosting languages. Let's think about it. What, what would make a good one? What's wrong with Scala? I mean, that's what we should be doing. Yeah. I'm having trouble reading these examples. Okay. N is mentioned there, but then not used subsequently. Yeah, that shouldn't be there. There just should be no N yeah. to type. Yeah, I said what I should have shown you is the invocation of that. Um, currently, N is 4, and I could have just gotten rid of that. Alternatively, I could have kept N and put it here as well, and then I can grow, I can have N, any number of inputs to my max n module, okay? So w is an array of four integers in this case. Um, this is, yeah, a vector of four uints of width w. Oh, w is the width? Yeah. Oh. Sorry, width w. We oh. use w a lot. What did you think w was? Okay, I don't know, sorry. I, I thought it was the input. Okay, all right. I should have described that. This notation is overloaded to mean the width. Um, sorry. Okay. And then the last thing is that you've got four of these things and it says A, B, B, C. Yeah. Presumably that's I should have shown you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I could have put any, I could have been A, B, B, C. Maybe it's better this way. It shows that I can, like, I can connect A, B, B, C to the inputs of this module, right? I can connect that and wire up a circuit that the thing is, there are four inputs that come in. Yeah. And they can get resolved separately. You're not requiring that the second and third input be the same. Should I like try to? No, you should just say okay. no, I'm not. That was uh, a typo. Okay, okay. It's, it's a typo and all the other stuff. But I think we got through it. And uh, now we're going to get to some fun stuff. And, um, and you guys will understand a lot better when you try it. So you so, say you're doing um, a design of a scripting language for DSLs and you want to look at the trade-offs and interesting ideas there. Yeah. So could you tell us something about the interesting ideas? Yeah, that that's, like that's at the end. Interesting idea. That's at the end. Okay, um, so you will tell us about the interesting stuff, but not until you tell us boring stuff. OK. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So everybody, um, has everyone gotten uh, VirtualBox started up? And uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 chisel. Sorry, good work. Yeah, Ch change it, chipper to chisel. I, I tried to, ch anyways, sorry. That, that, that's a really bad, that's even worse than N. Um, but hopefully, I won't make another mistake for the rest of the time. Uh, okay, did everyone get it started? Okay, cool. Um, okay, so. Okay, so now the next thing you do is just go into uh, Chipper tutorial and and uh, and Chipper and just do git pull on those two. How how long do we have? Um, how much? Fifteen. Okay. Oh yeah, thanks. I should be like just editing these slides as we we go. Um, yeah, sorry. UCB bar. All right.
Um, where is Max for? Then you remove the end. Oh, uh, okay. So that Max for takes to be off. Okay. All right. Um, so people can um, now try uh, getting into the tutorial directory, which is uh, chipper tutorial um, slash examples, and try uh, make byte selector dot out. Does it work? Change to uh, chipper tutorial slash, um, yeah. Uh, okay. So I'm I'm in chipper tutorial examples. I'm gonna do make clean and then make byte selector dot out, um, and it's gonna run this stanza compiler. Uh, create the program that generates the circuit, runs that, produces our IR, and then um, then uh, produces eventually a circuit and runs tests on it. Does that work for people? Byte selector? Okay. All right, try it now. <laughs> oh, you didn't do that. You got to do git pull on both of the directories. On the USB, USB bar or on chipper? Both. But it's OK. Just go ahead. And... OK. Did anyone get this to work? Now that, okay, cool. Okay. Whew. Okay, so I have put the, uh, these slides, if you want to consult them, uh, on, in the chipper doc bootcamp directory. Um, so you can get the PDF file. It's like, it should be on your uh, Linux image. Um, hopefully, there's a PDF PDF viewer on your on your uh, virtual box. But uh, there's the uh, the boot camp. Um, okay, so I'm gonna move on and um, and start with like a toy example, and then we'll we'll see how far we get before you get um, before break. So. So what I said was um, how the blueprint for writing a circuit is you have a bunch of um, inputs or ports. Basically, uh, this is greatest, greatest common de divisor. And so we have a bunch of ports, some input, some output. They have types. And then we have state elements. And the game is within this module, you're basically trying to wire the outputs in terms of the inputs using logic and state elements. Okay, so you can define these registers x, y, initialize them to the inputs, and then these this thing is these conditional connects um, that um, where x will be updated um, conditionally. If x is greater than y, then it will get x minus y. Otherwise, x y will be y minus x. Um, and then this, these, these are the registers that are being updated. If they're not updated in that cycle, they just hold their value. That's the way to interpret it. Um, and then finally, the output, the, the answer is in Z. And then we have this valid, this is going to take many clock cycles to run. And so we have a valid signal, say we actually have a final answer. And that's when Y is equal to 0. But that's basically how you write a circuit. And so from basically from here down, this is a program, OK? You can write any program, but you can also introduce state elements here or wires and so forth. Um, 
and uh, but you can intersperse program fragments in there. Okay, so you can uh, do the same with uh, GCD dot out. Make sure that works. Um, I, I, that will then produce this um, app that, or this. Uh, basically, I'm going to explain exactly how it works. But essentially, it, it produces like a, a executable that will simulate your circuit, um, and uh, that's a software simulation. We can also produce Verilog. So if you just um, go in the same directory examples and just say make gcd.v, it'll produce Verilog. Okay. Um, and you can kind of read what's going on there um, in terms of the Verilog file. And that will be all the generated files are in Chipper Tutorial generated and then with the directory name, either examples, problems, solutions, and then so you'll find gcd.v in, the, in uh, generated examples. Okay. Um, so, so I just want to point out a few things before break. Um, here's a full adder that I've done as a module. Um, and so I just basically it's all logic. There's no state. We're just wiring together all these logic elements. Um, and uh, we have these widths, one bit integers coming in. Um, here's what the width inference infers the widths of all these wires, you, unlike in, uh, in Verilog where you have to do that by hand, width inference works automatically for you in Chipper. Um, if you change the width to two, they'll propagate through to all the wires, and you can see them in the Verilog. Um, OK, so how are we doing on time? Um, let me just go a little bit more. Um, OK. Uh, so, like I said, you've seen me introducing uh, registers. Um, so here's like a little snippet. So you can introduce a register. So you can either um, have Z have the be delayed version of Y because um, it's going to get uh, latched on the clock uh, edge. Uh, so it's always going to be the last value of Y. Um, so that's just like assigning always Z to be Y, and then you can conditionally assign to it, like I said, to have this x, and then conditionally assign. Um, uh, and so, let's see. Um, so here's a shift register, where we're going to have a bunch of registers and assign them through the whole thing. And then this is like how we define them and assign to the previous register and eventually to the out, and this is how you do a module for that, and that's what the uh, Verilog looks like. Um, but you can also um, conditionally, you can have a shift signal that comes in, and you can do a conditional shifting, right, where the registers get updated only when the shift sign, uh, signal is high. Um, you can initialize those registers as well by giving this equal sign as the initial value for them. You, it also gives you the type the, you know, of, of those, which is convenient. So you can initialize it and give it the type. So now we've gotten conditional update with reset. Um, and in general, we have a whole bunch of literals. These are the hardware types that I was talking about. We have uints and essence. These are hardware types. They're distinct from the uh, software types or the compile time types um, that are uh, int. Um, OK, so I think we'll take a break right now.